Cubism Cubism is an early 20th century avant-garde art movement that revolutionized European painting and sculpture, and inspired related movements in music, literature and architecture. Cubism has been considered the most influential art movement of the 20th century. The term is broadly used in association with a wide variety of art produced in Paris, Montmartre, Montparnasse, and Putos, during the 1910s and throughout the 1920s. The movement was pioneered by Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque, joined by Jean Metzinger, Albert Gleises, Robert Delaunay, Henri Le Fauconnier, and Fernand Léger. One primary influence that led to Cubism was the representation of three-dimensional form in the late works of Paul Cézanne. A retrospective of Cézanne's paintings had been held at the Salon d'Automne of 1904, current works were displayed at the 1905 and 1906 Salon d'Automne followed by two commemorative retrospectives after his death in 1907. In Cubist artwork, objects are analyzed, broken up and reassembled in an abstracted form, instead of depicting objects from a single viewpoint, the artist depicts the subject from a multitude of viewpoints to represent the subject in a greater context. In France, offshoots of Cubism developed, including Orphism, Abstract Art and later Purism. The impact of Cubism was far-reaching and wide-ranging. In other countries, Futurism, Suprematism, Dada, Constructivism, De Steel, and Art Deco developed in response to Cubism. Early Futurist paintings hold in common with Cubism the fusing of the past and the present, the representation of different views of the subject pictured at the same time, also called multiple perspective, simultaneity, or multiplicity. While constructivism was influenced by Picasso's technique of constructing sculpture from separate elements. Other common threads between these disparate movements include the faceting or simplification of geometric forms, and the association of mechanization and modern life. Historians have divided the history of Cubism into phases. In one scheme, the first phase of Cubism, known as analytic Cubism, a phrase coined by Juan Gris a posteriori, was both radical and influential as a short but highly significant art movement between 1910 and 1912 in France. A second phase, synthetic Cubism, remained vital until around 1919, when the Surrealist movement gained popularity. English art historian Douglas Cooper proposed another scheme, describing three phases of Cubism in his book, The Cubist Epic. According to Cooper there was early Cubism, from 1906 to 1908, when the movement was initially developed in the studios of Picasso and Brock, the second phase being called High Cubism, from 1909 to 1914, during which time Juan Gris emerged as an important exponent after 1911, and finally Cooper referred to late Cubism, from 1914 to 1921, as the last phase of Cubism as a radical avant-garde movement. Douglas Cooper's restrictive use of these terms to distinguish the work of Brock, Picasso, Gris, from 1911, and Leger, to a lesser extent, implied an intentional value judgment. Cubism burgeoned between 1907 and 1911. Pablo Picasso's 1907 painting Les Demoiselles d'Avigno has often been considered a proto-cubist work. Georges Braque's 1908 Houses at Lestake, and related works, prompted the critic Louis Voxels, in Gil Blas, March 25, 1909, to refer to bizarre escubiques, cubicodities. Gertrude Stein referred to landscapes made by Picasso in 1909, such as Reservoir at Orta de Ebro. As the first Cubist paintings. The first organized group exhibition by Cubists took place at the Salon des Independence in Paris during the spring of 1911 in a room called Salle 41. It included works by Jean Metzinger, Albert Gleises, Fernand Leger, Robert Delaunay, and Henri Le Fauconnier, yet no works by Picasso or Brock were exhibited. By 1911, Picasso was recognized as the inventor of Cubism, while Brock's importance and precedence was argued later, with respect to his treatment of space volume and mass in the Lestake landscapes. But this view of Cubism is associated with a distinctly restrictive definition of which artists are properly to be called Cubists, wrote the art historian Christopher Green, marginalizing the contribution of the artists who exhibited at the Salon des Independence in 1911. The assertion that the Cubist depiction of space, mass, time, and volume supports, rather than contradicts, the flatness of the canvas was made by Daniel Henry Conweiler as early as 1920, but it was subject to criticism in the 1950s and 1960s, especially by Clement Greenberg. Contemporary views of Cubism are complex, 
formed to some extent in response to the Sal 41 Cubists, whose methods were too distinct from those of Picasso and Brock to be considered merely secondary to them. Alternative interpretations of Cubism have therefore developed. Wider views of Cubism include artists who were later associated with the Sal 41 artists, for example, Francis Picabia, the brothers Jacques Vion, Raymond Duchamp Vion, and Marcel Duchamp, who beginning in late 1911 formed the core of the Section Door, or the Putos Group, the sculptors Alexander Arkhipenko, Joseph Chalky, and Ossip Zadkin, as well as Jacques Lipschitz and Henri Lawrence, and painters such as Louis Marcusis, Roger de la Frenet. Fradisha Kupka, Diego Rivera, Leopold Servage, Auguste Turpin, André Lote, Gino Severini, after 1916, Maria Blanchard, after 1916, and Georges Valmier after 1918. More fundamentally, Christopher Green argues that Douglas Cooper's terms were later undermined by interpretations of the work of Picasso, Brock, Gris and Leger that stress iconographic and ideological questions rather than methods of representation. John Berger identifies the essence of cubism with the mechanical diagram. The metaphorical model of cubism is the diagram, the diagram being a visible symbolic representation of invisible processes, forces, structures. A diagram need not as choose certain aspects of appearance but these two will be treated as signs not as imitations or recreations. There was a distinct difference between Kahnweiler's cubists and the Salon cubists. Prior to 1914, Picasso, Brock. Gris and Leger, to a lesser extent, gained its support of a single committed art dealer in Paris, Daniel Henry Kahnweiler, who guaranteed them an annual income for the exclusive right to buy their works. Kahnweiler sold only to a small circle of connoisseurs. His support gave his artists the freedom to experiment in relative privacy. Picasso worked in Montmartre until 1912, while Brock and Gris remained there until after the First World War. Leger was based in Montparnasse. In contrast, the Salon Cubists built their reputation primarily by exhibiting regularly at the Salon d'Automne and the Salon des Independents, both major non-academic salons in Paris. They were inevitably more aware of public response and the need to communicate. Already in 1910, a group began to form, which included Metzinger, Gleises, Delaunay, and Leger. They met regularly at Henri Le Fauconnier's studio near the Boulevard Montparnasse. These soirees often included writers such as Guillaume Apollinaire and André Salmon. Together with other young artists, the group wanted to emphasize the research into form, in opposition to the neo-impressionist emphasis on color. Louis Voxels, in his review of the 26th Salon des Independents, 1910, made a passing and imprecise reference to Metzinger, Gleises, Delaunay, Leger and Le Fauconnier as ignorant geometers, reducing the human body, the sight, to pallid cubes. At the 1910 Salon d'Automne, a few months later, Metzinger exhibited his highly fractured new à la cheminée, nude, which was subsequently reproduced in both Du Cubism, 1912 and Les Pontre Cubists, 1913. The first public controversy generated by Cubism resulted from salon showings at the Independence during the spring of 1911. This showing by Metzinger, Gleises, Delaunay, Le Fauconnier and Leger brought Cubism to the attention of the general public for the first time. Amongst the Cubist works presented, Robert Delaunay exhibited his Eiffel Tower, Tour Eiffel, Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, New York. At the Salon d'Automne of the same year, in addition to the independence group of Sal 41, were exhibited works by André Oat, Marcel Duchamp, Jacques Vion, Roger de la Frenet, André Dunoyer de Segensac, and Franticek Kupka. The exhibition was reviewed in the October 8, 1911 issue of the New York Times. This article was published a year after Jalet Burgess The Wild Men of Paris, and two years prior to the Armory Show, which introduced astonished Americans, accustomed to realistic art, to the experimental styles of the European avant-garde, including Fauvism, Cubism, and Futurism. The 1911 New York Times article portrayed works by Picasso, Matisse, Duran, Metzinger and others dated before 1909, not exhibited at the 1911 Salon. The article was titled The Cubists Dominate Paris Fall Salon and subtitled Eccentric School of Painting Increases Its Vogue in the Current Art Exhibition, What Its Followers Attempt to Do. The subsequent 1912 Salon des Independents was marked by the presentation of Marcel Duchamp's new Descending a Staircase, No. 2, which itself caused a scandal, even amongst the Cubists. It was in fact rejected by the Hanging Committee, 
which included his brothers and other Cubists. Although the work was shown in the Salon de la Section d'Or in October 1912 and the 1913 Armory Show in New York, Duchamp never forgave his brothers and former colleagues for censoring his work. Juan Gris, a new addition to the Salon scene, exhibited his portrait of Picasso, Art Institute of Chicago, while Metzinger's two showings included La Femme au Cheval, Woman with a Horse 1911-1912, National Gallery of Denmark. Delaunay's monumental La Ville de Paris, Musée d'Art Moderne de La Ville de Paris, and Letcher's La Nos, The Wedding, Musée National d'Art Moderne, Paris, were also exhibited. The Cubist contribution to the 1912 Salon d'Atom created scandal regarding the use of government-owned buildings, such as the Grand Palais, to exhibit such artwork. The indignation of the politician Jean-Pierre Philippe Lampe made the front page of Le Journal, October 5, 1912. The controversy spread to the Municipal Council of Paris, leading to a debate in the Chambre des Deputes about the use of public funds to provide the venue for such art. The Cubists were defended by the socialist deputy, Marcel Sembat. It was against this background of public anger that Jean Metzinger and Albert Gleises wrote Du Cubism, published by Eugène Figuier in 1912, translated to English and Russian in 1913. Among the works exhibited were Le Fauconnier's vast composition Les Montagnards Attacks par des Hours, Mountaineers Attacked by Bears, now at Rhode Island School of Design Museum, Joseph Chucky's Du Femme, Two Women, a sculpture now lost, in addition to the highly abstract paintings by Kupka, Amorpha, the National Gallery, Prague, and Picabia, La Source, The Spring, Museum of Modern Art New York. The most extreme forms of Cubism were not those practiced by Picasso and Brock, who resisted total abstraction. Other Cubists, by contrast, especially Fradishek Kupka, and those considered Dorfus by Apollinaire, Delaunay, Leger, Picabia and Duchamp, accepted abstraction by removing visible subject matter entirely. Kupka's two entries at the 1912 Salon d'Atome, Amorpha Fuga du Couleur and Amorpha Chromatique showed, were highly abstract, or non-representational, and metaphysical in orientation. Both Duchamp in 1912 and Picabia from 1912 to 1914 developed an expressive and elusive abstraction dedicated to complex emotional and sexual themes. Beginning in 1912 Delaunay painted a series of paintings entitled Simultaneous Windows followed by a series entitled Forms Circulaires, in which he combined planar structures with bright prismatic hues, based on the optical characteristics of juxtaposed colors his departure from reality in the depiction of imagery was quasi-complete. In 1913-14 Leger produced a series entitled Contrasts of Forms, giving a similar stress to color, line and form. His cubism, despite its abstract qualities, was associated with themes of mechanization and modern life. Apollinaire supported these early developments of abstract cubism in Les Pontre Cubists, 1913, writing of a new pure painting in which the subject was vacated. But in spite of his use of the term morphism, these works were so different that they defy attempts to place them in a single category. Also labeled an orphist by Apollinaire, Marcel Duchamp was responsible for another extreme development inspired by Cubism. The ready made arose from a joint consideration that the work itself is considered an object, just as a painting, and that it uses the material detritus of the world, as collage and papier coal in the Cubist construction and assemblage. The next logical step, for Duchamp, was to present an ordinary object as a self sufficient work of art representing only itself. In 1913 he attached a bicycle wheel to a kitchen stool and in 1914 selected a bottle drying rack as a sculpture in its own right. The section door, also known as Group Deputos, founded by some of the most conspicuous Cubists, was a collective of painters, sculptors and critics associated with Cubism and Orphism, active from 1911 through about 1914, coming to prominence in the wake of their controversial showing at the 1911 Salon des Independents. The Salon de la Section d'Or at the Galerie La Boétie in Paris, October 1912, was arguably the most important pre-World War I Cubist exhibition, exposing Cubism to a wide audience. Over 200 works were displayed, and the fact that many of the artists showed artworks representative of their development from 1909 to 1912 gave the exhibition the allure of a Cubist retrospective. The group seems to have adopted the name Section d'Or to distinguish themselves from the narrower definition of Cubism developed in parallel by Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque in the Montmartre Quarter of Paris, and to show that Cubism, rather than being an isolated art form, 
represented the continuation of a grand tradition, indeed, the golden ratio had fascinated Western intellectuals of diverse interests for at least 2,400 years. The idea of the section door originated in the course of conversations between Metzinger, Gleises, and Jacques Villon. The group's title was suggested by Villon, after reading a 1910 translation of Leonardo da Vinci's Trattato della Pittura by Josephine Pelladin. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Europeans were discovering African, Polynesian, Micronesian, and Native American art. Artists such as Paul Gauguin, Henri Matisse, and Pablo Picasso were intrigued and inspired by the stark power and simplicity of styles of those foreign cultures. Around 1906, Picasso met Matisse through Gertrude Stein, at a time when both artists had recently acquired an interest in primitivism, Iberian sculpture, African art, and African tribal masks. They became friendly rivals and competed with each other throughout their careers, perhaps leading to Picasso entering a new period in his work by 1907, marked by the influence of Greek, Iberian and African art. Picasso's paintings of 1907 have been characterized as proto-Cubism, as notably seen in Les Demoiselles d'Avigno, the antecedent of Cubism. The art historian Douglas Cooper states that Paul Gauguin and Paul Cézanne were particularly influential to the formation of Cubism and especially important of the paintings of Picasso during 1906 and 1907. Cooper goes on to say, the Demoiselles is generally referred to as the first Cubist picture. This is an exaggeration for although it was a major first step towards Cubism it is not yet Cubist. The disruptive, expressionist element in it is even contrary to the spirit of Cubism, which looked at the world in a detached, realistic spirit. Nevertheless, the Demoiselles is the logical picture to take as the starting point for Cubism, because it marks the birth of a new pictorial idiom, because in it Picasso violently overturned established conventions and because all that followed grew out of it. The most serious objection to regarding the Demoiselles as the origin of Cubism, with its evident influence of primitive art, is that such deductions are unhistorical, wrote the art historian Daniel Robbins. This familiar explanation fails to give adequate consideration to the complexities of a flourishing art that existed just before and during the period when Picasso's new painting developed. Between 1905 and 1908, a conscious search for a new style caused rapid changes in art across France, Germany, Holland, Italy, and Russia. The Impressionists had used a double point of view, and both Lenabi and the Symbolists, who also admired Cézanne, flattened the picture plane, reducing their subjects to simple geometric forms. Neo-Impressionist structure and subject matter, most notably to be seen in the works of Georges Sra, for example, Parade de Cirque, Le Chahut and Le Cirque, was another important influence. There were also parallels in the development of literature and social thought. In addition to Sra, the roots of Cubism are to be found in the two distinct tendencies of Cézanne's later work, first his breaking of the painted surface into small multifaceted areas of paint, thereby emphasizing the plural viewpoint given by binocular vision, and second his interest in the simplification of natural forms into cylinders, spheres, and cones. However, the Cubists explored this concept further than Cézanne. They represented all the surfaces of depicted objects seen as single picture plane, as if the objects had all their faces visible at the same time. This new kind of depiction revolutionized the way objects could be visualized in painting and art. The historical study of Cubism began in the late 1920s, drawing it first from sources of limited data, namely the opinions of Guillaume Apollinaire. It came to rely heavily on Daniel Henry Conweiler's book Der Vexum Cubismus, published in 1920 which centered on the developments of Picasso, Brock, Leger, and Gray. The terms analytical and synthetic which subsequently emerged have been widely accepted since the mid-1930s. Both terms are historical impositions that occurred after the facts they identify. Neither phase was designated as such at the time corresponding works were created. If Conweiler considers Cubism as Picasso and Brock, wrote Daniel Robbins, our only fault is in subjecting other Cubists' works to the rigors of a limited definition. The traditional interpretation of Cubism, formulated post facto as a means of understanding the works of Brock and Picasso, has affected our appreciation of other 20th century artists. It is difficult to apply to painters such as Jean Metzinger, Albert Gleises, Robert Delaunay, and Henri Le Fauconnier, whose fundamental differences from traditional Cubism compelled Conweiler to question whether to call them Cubists at all. According to Daniel Robbins, to suggest that merely because these artists developed differently or varied from the traditional pattern they deserve to be relegated to a secondary or satellite role in Cubism is a profound mistake. 
The history of the term Cubism usually stresses the fact that Matisse referred to cubes in connection with a painting by Brock in 1908, and that the term was published twice by the critic Louis Vauxhalles in a similar context. However, the word cube was used in 1906 by another critic, Louis Chesfant, with reference not to Picasso or Brock but rather to Metzinger and Delaunay. The critical use of the word cube goes back at least to May 1901 when Jean Beryl, reviewing the work of Henri Edmond Cross at the Independence in Artet Literature, commented that he uses a large and square pointillism, giving the impression of mosaic. One even wonders why the artist has not used cubes off solid matter diversely colored, they would make pretty revetments. Robert Herbert, 1968, p. 221. The term cubism did not come into general usage until 1911, mainly with reference to Metzinger, Gleises, Delaunay, and Leger. In 1911, the poet and critic Guillaume Apollinaire accepted the term on behalf of a group of artists invited to exhibit at the Brussels Independence Stop the following year, in preparation for the Salon de la Section d'Or. Metzinger and Gleises wrote and published Du Cubism in an effort to dispel the confusion raging around the word, and as a major defense of Cubism, which had caused a public scandal following the 1911 Salon des Independents and the 1912 Salon d'Altomne in Paris. Clarifying their aims as artists, this work was the first theoretical treatise on Cubism and it still remains the clearest and most intelligible. The result, not solely a collaboration between its two authors, reflected discussions by the circle of artists who met in Pudos and Courbevoie. It mirrored the attitudes of the artists of Passy, which included Picabia and the Duchamp brothers, to whom sections of it were read prior to publication. The concept developed in Du Cubism of observing a subject from different points in space and time simultaneously, i.e., the act of moving around an object to seize it from several successive angles fused into a single image, multiple viewpoints, mobile perspective, simultaneity or multiplicity, is a generally recognized device used by the cubists. The 1912 Manifesto du Cubism by Metzinger and Gleises was followed in 1913 by Les Pontre Cubists, a collection of reflections and commentaries by Guillaume Apollinaire. Apollinaire had been closely involved with Picasso beginning in 1905 and Brock beginning in 1907, but gave as much attention to artists such as Metzinger, Gleises, Delaunay, Picabia, and Duchamp. The fact that the 1912 exhibition had been curated to show the successive stages through which Cubism had transited, and that Du Cubism had been published for the occasion, indicates the artist's intention of making their work comprehensible to a wide audience, art critics, art collectors, art dealers and the general public. Undoubtedly, Due to the great success of the exhibition, Cubism became avant-garde movement recognized as a genre or style in art with a specific common philosophy or goal. A significant modification of Cubism between 1914 and 1916 was signaled by a shift towards a strong emphasis on large overlapping geometric planes and flat surface activity. This grouping of styles of painting and sculpture, especially significant between 1917 and 1920, was practiced by several artists, particularly those under contract with the art dealer and collector Leonce Rosenberg. The tightening of the compositions, the clarity and sense of order reflected in these works, led to its being referred to by the critic Maurice Reynal as crystal cubism. Considerations manifested by cubists prior to the outset of World War I, such as the fourth dimension, dynamism of modern life, the occult, and Henri Bergson's concept of duration, had now been vacated, replaced by a purely formal frame of reference. Crystal cubism, and its associated repel all ordre, has been linked with an inclination, by those who served the armed forces and by those who remain in the civilian sector, to escape the realities of the Great War, both during and directly following the conflict. The purifying of cubism from 1914 through the mid 1920s, with its cohesive unity and voluntary constraints, has been linked to a much broader ideological transformation towards conservatism in both French society and French culture. The most innovative period of Cubism was before 1914. After World War I, with the support given by the dealer Léonce Rosenberg, Cubism returned as a central issue for artists, and continued as such until the mid-1920s when its avant-garde status was rendered questionable by the emergence of geometric abstraction and surrealism in Paris. Many Cubists, including Picasso, Brock, Gris, Leger, Gleises, and Metzinger, while developing other styles, returned periodically to Cubism, even well after 1925. 
Cubism re-emerged during the 1920s and the 1930s in the work of the American Stuart Davis and the Englishman Ben Nicholson. In France, however, Cubism experienced a decline beginning in about 1925. Léonce Rosenberg exhibited not only the artists stranded by Conweiler's exile but others including Lawrence, Lipschitz, Metzinger, Gleises, Chalky, Herpin, and Severini. In 1918 Rosenberg presented a series of Cubist exhibitions at his gallery La Forme Moderne in Paris. Attempts were made by Louis Voxels to claim that Cubism was dead, but these exhibitions, along with a well-organized Cubist show at the 1920 Salon des Independents and a revival of the Salon de la Section d'Or in the same year, demonstrated it was still alive. The re-emergence of Cubism coincided with the appearance from about 1917-24 of a coherent body of theoretical writing by Pierre Reverdy, Maurice Raynal and Daniel Henry Conweiler and, among the artists, by Gris, Leger, and Glises. The occasional return to classicism, figurative work either exclusively or alongside Cubist work, experienced by many artists during this period, called neoclassicism has been linked to the tendency to evade the realities of the war and also to the cultural dominance of a classical or Latin image of France during and immediately following the war. Cubism after 1918 can be seen as part of a wide ideological shift towards conservatism in both French society and culture. Yet, Cubism itself remained evolutionary both within the oeuvre of individual artists, such as Gris and Metzinger, and across the work of artists as different from each other as Brock, Leger, and Glises. Cubism as a publicly debated movement became relatively unified and open to definition. Its theoretical purity made it a gauge against which such diverse tendencies as realism or naturalism, Dada, surrealism and abstraction could be compared. Japan and China were among the first countries in Asia to be influenced by Cubism. Contact first occurred via European texts translated and published in Japanese art journals in the 1910s. In the 1920s, Japanese and Chinese artists who studied in Paris, for example those enrolled at the École Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts, brought back with them both an understanding of modern art movements, including Cubism. Notable works exhibiting Cubist qualities were Tetsugoro Yorozu's Self-Portrait with Red Eyes, 1912, and Fang Ganman's Melody in Autumn, 1934. The Cubism of Picasso and Brock had more than a technical or formal significance, and the distinct attitudes and intentions of the Salon Cubists produced different kinds of Cubism rather than a derivative of their work. It is by no means clear, in any case, wrote Christopher Green, to what extent these other cubists depended on Picasso and Brock for their development of such techniques as faceting, passage and multiple perspective, they could well have arrived at such practices with little knowledge of true cubism in its early stages, guided above all by their own understanding of Cezanne. The works exhibited by these cubists at the 1911 and 1912 salons extended beyond the conventional Cezanne-like subjects, the postmodel, still life and landscape, favored by Picasso and Brock to include large-scale modern life subjects. Aimed at a large public, these works stressed the use of multiple perspective and complex planar faceting for expressive effect while preserving the eloquence of subjects endowed with literary and philosophical connotations. In Du Cube as Metzinger and Gleises explicitly related the sense of time to multiple perspective, giving symbolic expression to the notion of duration proposed by the philosopher Henri Bergson according to which life is subjectively experienced as a continuum, with the past flowing into the present and that present merging into the future. The Salon Cubists used the faceted treatment of solid and space and effects of multiple viewpoints to convey a physical and psychological sense of the fluidity of consciousness, blurring the distinctions between past, present and future. One of the major theoretical innovations mad be the Salon Cubists, independently of Picasso and Brock, was that of simultaneity, drawing to greater or lesser extent on theories of Henri Poincaré, Ernst Mach, Charles Henry, Maurice Prince, and Henri Bergson. With simultaneity, the concept of separate spatial and temporal dimensions was comprehensively challenged. Linear perspective developed during the Renaissance was vacated. The subject matter was no longer considered from a specific point of view at a moment in time, but built following a selection of successive viewpoints, i.e., as if viewed simultaneously from numerous angles, and in multiple dimensions with the eye free to roam from one to the other. This technique of representing simultaneity, multiple viewpoints, or relative motion, is pushed to a high degree of complexity in Gleis's monumental La de Picajit's Moisson, Harvest Threshing exhibited at the 1912 Salon de la Section d'Or, the Fauconnier's abundance shown at the independence of 1911, 
and Delaunay's City of Paris, shown at the Independence in 1912. These ambitious works are some of the largest paintings in the history of Cubism. Ledger's The Wedding, also shown at the Salon des Independents in 1912, gave form to the notion of simultaneity by presenting different motifs as occurring within a single temporal frame, where responses to the past and present interpenetrate with collective force. The conjunction of such subject matter with simultaneity aligns Salon Cubism with early futurist paintings by Umberto Boccioni, Gino Severini, and Carlo Carra themselves made in response to early Cubism. Cubism and modern European art was introduced into the United States at the now legendary 1913 Armory Show in New York City, which then traveled to Chicago and Boston. In the Armory Show Pablo Picasso exhibited La Femme au Pas de Moutarde, 1910, the sculpture Head of a Woman, Fernand, 1909-10, Le Arbre, 1907, amongst other Cubist works. Jacques Bion exhibited seven important and large dry points, while his brother Marcel Duchamp shocked the American public with his painting New Descending a Staircase, No. 2, 1912. Francis Picabia exhibited his abstractions La Danse à la Source and La Procession, Seville, both of 1912. Albert Gleises exhibited La Femme aux Flox, 1910, and L'Homme au Balcon, 1912, two highly stylized and faceted Cubist works. Georges Brock Fernand Lachey, Raymond Duchamp-Vion, Roger de la Frenet and Alexander Arkhipenko also contributed examples of their Cubist works. Just as in painting, Cubist sculpture is rooted in Paul Cézanne's reduction of painted objects into component planes and geometric solids, cubes, spheres, cylinders, and cones. And just as in painting, it became a pervasive influence and contributed fundamentally to constructivism and futurism. Cubist sculpture developed in parallel to Cubist painting. During the autumn of 1909 Picasso sculpted Head of a Woman, Fernand, with positive features depicted by negative space and vice versa. According to Douglas Cooper, the first true Cubist sculpture was Picasso's impressive woman's head, modeled in 1909-10, a counterpart in three dimensions to many similar analytical and faceted heads in his paintings at the time. These positive-slash-negative reversals were ambitiously exploited by Alexander Arkhipenko in 1912-13, for example in Woman Walking. Joseph Chalky, after Arkhipenko, was the first sculptor in Paris to join the Cubists, with whom he exhibited from 1911 onwards. They were followed by Raymond duchamp Vion and then in 1914 by Jacques Lipschitz, Henri Lawrence, and Ossip Sadkin. Indeed, Cubist construction was as influential as any pictorial Cubist innovation. It was the stimulus behind the proto-constructivist work of both Naum Gabo and Vladimir Tatlin and thus the starting point for the entire constructive tendency in 20th century modernist sculpture. Cubism formed an important link between early 20th century art and architecture. The historical, theoretical, and socio-political relationships between avant-garde practices in painting, sculpture and architecture had early ramifications in France, Germany, the Netherlands and Czechoslovakia. Though there are many points of intersection between Cubism and architecture, only a few direct links between them can be drawn. Most often, the connections are made by reference to shared formal characteristics, faceting of form, spatial ambiguity, transparency, and multiplicity. Architectural interest in Cubism centered on the dissolution and reconstitution of three dimensional form, using simple geometric shapes, juxtaposed without the illusions of classical perspective. Diverse elements could be superimposed, made transparent or penetrate one another, while retaining their spatial relationships. Cubism had become an influential factor in the development of modern architecture from 1912, La Maison Cubist, by Raymond duchamp Vion and André Mayer, onwards, developing in parallel with architects such as Peter Behrens and Walter Gropius, with a simplification of building design, the use of materials appropriate to industrial production, and the increased use of glass. Cubism was relevant to an architecture seeking a style that needed not refer to the past. Thus, what had become a revolution in both painting and sculpture was applied as part of a profound reorientation towards a changed world. The coup of futurist ideas of Filippo Tommaso Marinetti influenced attitudes in avant-garde architecture. The influential De Stijl movement embraced the aesthetic principles of neoplasticism developed by Piet Mondrian under the influence of Cubism in Paris. De Stijl was also linked by Gino Severini to Cubist theory through the writings of Albert Gleises. However, 
the linking of basic geometric forms with inherent beauty and ease of industrial application, which had been prefigured by Marcel Duchamp from 1914, was left to the founders of Purism, Amade Ozenfant and Charles Edouard Gineret, better known as Le Corbusier, who exhibited paintings together in Paris and published a pre le cubisme in 1918. Le Corbusier's ambition had been to translate the properties of his own style of cubism to architecture. Between 1918 and 1922, Le Corbusier concentrated his efforts on purist theory and painting. In 1922, Le Corbusier and his cousin Jean Aret opened a studio in Paris at 35 Rue de Sèvres. His theoretical studies soon advanced into many different architectural projects. At the 1912 Salon d'Automne, an architectural installation was exhibited that quickly became known as Maison Cubist, Cubist House, signed Raymond Duchamp Vion and Andre Mer along with a group of collaborators. Metzinger and Gleises and Du Cubisme, written during the assemblage of the Maison Cubist, wrote about the autonomous nature of art, stressing the point that decorative considerations should not govern the spirit of art. Decorative work, to them, was the antithesis of the picture. The true picture wrote Metzinger and Gleises, bears its raison d'etre within itself. It can be moved from a church to a drawing room, from a museum to a study. Essentially independent, necessarily complete, it need not immediately satisfy the mind, on the contrary, it should lead it, little by little, towards the fictitious depths in which the coordinative light resides. It does not harmonize with this or that ensemble, it harmonizes with things in general, with the universe, it is an organism. Mare's ensembles were accepted as frames for cubist works because they allowed paintings and sculptures their independence, writes Christopher Green, creating a play of contrasts, hence the involvement not only of Gleises and Metzinger themselves, but of Marie Laurenson, the Duchamp brothers, Raymond Duchamp Vion designed the facade, and Mare's old friends Leger and Roger Lafrenet. La Maison Cubist was a fully furnished house, with a staircase, wrought iron banisters, a living room, the Salon Bourgeois, where paintings by Marcel Duchamp, Metzinger, Woman with a Fan, Gleises, Laurenson and Leger were hung, and a bedroom. It was an example of l'art decorative, a home within which cubist art could be displayed in the comfort and style of modern, bourgeois life. Spectators at the Salon d'Automne passed through the full-scale 10 by 3 meter plaster model of the ground floor of De Facade, designed by Duchamp Vion. This architectural installation was subsequently exhibited at the 1913 Armory Show New York, Chicago, and Boston, listed in the catalog of the New York exhibit as Raymond Duchamp Vion, number 609, and entitled Facade Architectural, Plaster, Facade Architectural. Several years after World War I, in 1927, cubists Joseph Chalky, Jacques Lipschitz, Louis Marcusis, Henri Lawrence, the sculptor Gustave Miklus, and others collaborated in the decoration of a studio house, Rue St. James, Noyes sur Seine, designed by the architect Paul Rowe and owned by the French fashion designer Jacques Doucet, also a collector of post impressionist and cubist paintings, including Les Demoiselles d'Avigno, which he bought directly from Picasso's studio. Lawrence designed the fountain, Chalky designed Doucet's staircase, Lipschitz made the fireplace mantle, and Marcus has made a cubist rug. The original cubist architecture is very rare. There is only one country in the world where cubism was really applied to architecture, namely Bohemia, today Czech Republic, and especially its capital, Prague. Czech architects were the first and only ones in the world to ever design original cubist buildings. Cubist architecture flourished for the most part between 1910 to 1914, but the cubist or cubism influenced buildings were also built after the World War I. After the war, the architectural style called Rondo Cubism was developed in Prague, fusing the cubist architecture with round shapes. In their theoretical rules, the cubist architects expressed the requirement of dynamism, which would surmount the matter and calm contained in it, through a creative idea, so that the result would evoke feelings of dynamism and expressive plasticity in the viewer. This should be achieved by shapes derived from pyramids, cubes, and prisms, by arrangements and compositions of oblique surfaces, mainly triangular sculpted facades and protruding crystal-like units, reminiscent of the so-called diamond cut, or even cavernous that are reminiscent of the late Gothic architecture. In this way, the entire surfaces of the facades including even the gables and dormers are sculpted. The grills as well as other architectural ornaments attain a three-dimensional form. Thus, new forms of windows and doors were also created, e.g., hexagonal windows. Czech cubist architects also design cubist furniture.
Walker. The leading Cubist architects were Pavel Janik, Joseph Gokar, Vlastislav Hoffman, Emil Kralicek, and Joseph Chakal. They worked mostly in Prague but also in other Bohemian towns. The best-known Cubist building is the House of the Black Madonna in the Old Town of Prague built in 1912 by Joseph Gokar with the only Cubist Café in the world, Grand Café Orient. Vlastislav Hoffman built the entrance pavilions of Dablis Cemetery in 1912-1914, Joseph Chuckle designed several residential houses under Vicherod. A Cubist street lamp has also been preserved near the Wenceslas Square, designed by Emil Kralicek in 1912 who also built the Diamond House in the new town of Prague around 1913. The influence of Cubism extended to other artistic fields, outside painting and sculpture. In literature, the written works of Gertrude Stein employ repetition and repetitive phrases as building blocks in both passages and whole chapters. Most of Stein's important works utilize this technique, including the novel The Making of Americans, 1906-08. Not only were they the first important patrons of Cubism, Gertrude Stein and her brother Leo were also important influences in Cubism as well. Picasso in turn was an important influence on Stein's writing. In the field of American fiction, William Faulkner's 1930 novel As I Lay Dying can be read as an interaction with the Cubist mode. The novel features narratives of the diverse experiences of 15 characters which, when taken together, produce a single cohesive body. The poets generally associated with Cubism are Guillaume Apollinaire, Blaise Sindrar, Jean Cocteau, Max Jacob, Andre Salmon, and Pierre Reverdy. As American poet Kenneth Rexroth explains, Cubism in poetry is the conscious, deliberate dissociation and recombination of elements into a new artistic entity made self sufficient by its rigorous architecture. This is quite different from the free association of the surrealists in the combination of unconscious utterance and political nihilism of Dada. Nonetheless, the Cubist poet's influence on both Cubism and the later movements of Dada and Surrealism was profound. Louis Aragon, founding member of Surrealism, said that for Breton, Soupault, L. Arndt himself, Raverty was our immediate elder, the exemplary poet. Though not as well remembered as the Cubist painters, these poets continue to influence and inspire. American poets John Ashbery and Ron Paget have recently produced new translations of Raverty's work. Wallace Stevens' 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird is also said to demonstrate how Cubism's multiple perspectives can be translated into poetry. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.